of you, <laughs> many of you have been challenged in that area before. But I thank God that uh, the, the curfew times, they have eased up on the weekend and kind of uh, minimized it quite a bit. It was a pleasure to get out the house. In fact, I felt as if I was locked up in prison <laughs> at one point. So I'm sure many of you can attest to that also. But thank God we all made it through so far. I give my condolences, condolences sorry, to those family members who would have lost loved ones during this time. And not just locally, but even throughout the entire world. Uh, clearly, COVID-19 has caused us to uh, do things a lot different. And that's in every aspect, whether it's family, church, business, or whatever it is. We uh, have to now take a different approach to how we do business. One of the most fascinating things about uh, that I observed during all of this was the fact how things abruptly change. You know, there was like no time to figure it out. I mean, you just had to be witty and come up with the best solutions to the problems that were presenting themselves during this time uh, of, of COVID-19. But I thank God that I'm back in the studio again and I'm back here uh, to share with you. Now, before I get into it, the last time that I spoke with you, I said to you that I was supposed to be starting a series, and that series would have been on this particular book that I have read called Church Mafia. And this is something that is very dear to me. In fact, when I read this book, it resonated with so much that I believe, so much that I know, so much that I see is happening in the churches today that is totally anti-God. A lot of these uh, so-called uh, miracles and, and healing oils and waters and different cloths and all of these stuff you have to purchase to, to, to achieve miracles and so on. And at some point, you've got to get fed up with it because you know it's absolute nonsense, all of the different... The more and more you watch and listen to these things, the more and more you see where the scriptures are being discarded, pushed to the side, and people are now putting in their own half, half, puff, puff, spin around, take a red claw. Everybody is advising you from so-called visions that they would have had from God or prophetic words. And in these prophetic words and visions, and this is what I have observed, where the Bible is totally discounted, totally pushed in the bush somewhere, and now the, the, the prophecies of men comes about. I did a video, I did a video, uh, several videos actually while I was off, and I admonish you to visit my YouTube or even Facebook and take a look at those videos because I dealt in detail. I dealt in one particular teaching where I had, a, I had some folks that emailed me and some even called me and asked me what I think about, you know, the red cloth and tying it on your doorknob so that Mr. Corona don't come to you and kill you and all this other stuff. And if you don't put it on the door, then the dead angel is going to just murder you. Well, if that's the case, then we should have had a bunch of mass murders around here. A lot of people, the, the funeral home and the morgue should have been full right about now. And I said to a lot of these people, even prior to me doing the video, I said, think about it for a second. You had God Bible from the time you were born. He told you, don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie, don't commit fornication, don't do adultery, don't do all these things. Then he tells you the penalties behind it, and you choose to do none of them. You So you choose to go opposite to everything that God has told you, right? Somebody crawled out the bush somewhere during the opportune time of Corona and said that the Lord appeared to them. And I'm not judging their prophecies. I'm just saying my, I'm giving my view here based on the scriptures, of course. Somebody crawled out of some hole somewhere and said the Lord said, get a red cloth and just rub your head or do some nonsense with it. And I was so amazed to see the places that I visit and I would see this red voodoo cloth on these people doorknob. Because they believe more in the claw than that Bible they had all along. So they figure that, okay, even though I'm living in sin, even though I'm shocking up with this man or this woman, even though I cuss every day, even though I'm not a Christian, I could put this red cloth on my knob or my door or whatever, and this quote-unquote dead angel is going to pass by and say, okay, that's Kevin. Oh, you fornicating, you lying. Oh, you're doing that with the red cloth there, so I'll pass him. But the Christian up the road who love God, who serve God, decide not to put the red cloth there. So the angel is going to kill him, kill him, even though he was doing right all along, but the, the cloth is in there. So sometimes they say to people, sit back, man, just for two seconds, before you bring this junk to me, refer to the scriptures. What is the, how is it you're so quick to discount the word of God 
and, and just for, for the mere words of men. How is this? You know, I, you, 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 I, it's just beyond me. I mean, I just, anyone could come from anywhere and tell you anything. And the Bible was telling you all along. I used the scripture, and I think it's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, where Solomon says, My son, uh, listen to my commandments and hear the voice of your father or whatever. And this is what he said. He said that if you follow the laws of God, and I'm paraphrasing it, if you do the will of God, follow the rules and the laws of God according to the book that you always had before the red cloth, he says, I will give you long life, length of days, and peace shall be added to you. So how could the prophecy of not putting the red cloth in you dying supersede that rule that was written in the Bible eons ago? See, this is the stuff that this book I'm talking about, Church Mafia, that's why I resonate with it so much. The hocus pocus, these opportunities that these fake people are not, I'm not, again, I ain't calling no name, I ain't judging nobody. But let me tell you what I do believe, though. I believe the scriptures. It is the scriptures that I believe in. Now, am I saying to you that God cannot speak to somebody and says, do some mud something or something strange in America? And I'm not telling you that. What I am saying to you, though, I am looking at that prophecy and now I'm assessing it according to the word of God. And all throughout the word I'm reading, if you do my law, if you follow my commandments, if you submit to my rules, then shall you be blessed. Then shall you have wealth. Then shall your children, all of this was already there before the, the new called slate of Corona spiritual rules came about. Well, guess what? I didn't put a red cloth on my door. For what? When all along I had Jesus Christ, all along I was repenting of my sins asking God to help me day by day, covering my family with the blood of Jesus, with the whole arm of God, doing all of that before Coroni came. So where the dead angel is? So what I'm saying to you people, and this is what this ministry is all about, is some things we just got to unlearn. Some things we got to take as tradition and toss it whoop, right in the garbage and now begin to subscribe to what the Bible was actually saying all along. How is it that you refuse to follow the rules that were there all along, but somebody come and says, the Lord is saying right now, that if, if you don't brush your teeth with Colgate, I, I hear the Lord say all the molars and incisors and all the other people follow your mouth, and you quick, you get scared, you're full of fear, now you're going all over the place buying all of these expensive toothpaste because Colgate is making teeth fall out, See, it is this kind of garbage. Can I say this? It is this kind of absolute dung that people who do not read the word of God, people who do not subscribe to the scriptures, this is the kind of foolishness that they grab onto. And I tell my family members up front, don't come around me with no nonsense, with no red cloth. I don't practice obey and I don't do voodoo. I preach against those things because that's what that is. The blood of Jesus Christ, okay? That is what was shared on Calvary to, 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 to undertake or overtake any form of virus, disease, or whatever. And when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that's what I sign on to. So when we talk about the red cloth and putting it on your knob, I need to know no, 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 no magic. Don't bring that foolishness here because I don't subscribe to that. Now, I'm, again, I ain't calling no name. I ain't judging nobody prophecy. They came to me with it, and this is what I gave them as my opinion, all right? So for me, I will continue to obey the laws of God, whether corona or moruna come, whether a disease. Now, I don't care what come. I don't need to know what coming. I Tell me a prophecy. Tell me a flood coming. Tell me hurricane coming. Tell me tsunami coming. Tell me you see king wave. I discount your prophecy, you know. But let me tell you what I was doing before you came with your prophecy. I was reading my word. I was following my commandments. I was being nice to my neighbor. I was treating people fairly. I was worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So if I was always doing this, you're telling me now that God is going to circumvent all of what he said in his word. Because he said, if you don't put that red cloth on your doorknob, I can kill you. You mean after I followed all your other rules? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I can kill you. Well, I don't know what God you all serve anybody. Whatever demon God that is, just don't bring that garbage around here. Because Kevin ain't into that foolishness. You understand? That's why I don't put up with that garbage. I want to hear the scriptures. Again, let me be clear. I ain't saying, I ain't judging, I ain't critiquing your prophecy. 
I ain't calling nobody name. All Kevin is saying right here, right now. They brought the situation to me. That is how I address it. I told them, my family members and friends, I said, listen to me carefully, hear me? You, you see what this Bible say? You see what Deuteronomy 28 say? He says, if you obey, hearken, and observe to do all my laws, then shall these blessings come upon you and they shall overtake you. And then he gave a cadre of benefits that come as a result of adhering to his word. You weren't doing that. But someone come from off the, or around the corner, all right? And throw, show on some religious regalia and start telling you about the prophecy and cracking in their voice and crying while they're telling you it. And just in, and just in, just investing fear in your life. So you went grab all your old red drawers and all kind of stuff and write, putting it all on these little children door and your door, your husband, the, the shop door to do what? You're still living in sin. You still hate your sisters and brothers who you don't speak to. Your ma dead leave this idea. She dead vexed with you. You dead vexed with her. God should have knocked you down then. So don't come with that. Unlike others, I don't fall for that foolishness. I always say to you, if you cannot bring Kevin you in that scripture, do not come to me. I don't want to hear your church policies. I don't want to hear your theory. I don't want to hear nothing. Bring me that scripture. Show me what thus said the Lord. Because you ain't going to be rich Kevin no more. You ain't going to swing. Those days are finished. All right? Now, whoever pastor or leader decide to run with that game, all I say is don't bring it here. And if you come, if you come, the only way you will be entertained by me is if you bring in the word of God. That's it. Now, if you want to talk about hockey or softball or something else, I, I fine with that. But if you come in to refute the scriptures, come with the scriptures. Come with the scriptures. And don't come bending the scriptures. Quote exactly what that scriptures say. So people need to wake up. Those days are over. We are co Corona or COVID-19. And in my video that I did, I said, I, I praise my my Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross for shutting every church door. I, When I tell you I give God the glory for that, I gave God the glory for that. And it, it has done so much good, as well as it's done some bad, but it's done a lot of good because it, it changed a lot of way, a lot of the ways that we used to do things, especially as it relates to religion. I was so overwhelmed and taken aback when I saw the amount of young people coming online, Twitter, Periscope, Facebook, YouTube, ministering the word of God, preaching and teaching. I mean, it did my heart so well to see people finally adhering to the laws of God. And what was the law of God? He says, go ye into the world and preach my gospel, not into the church. Go, the, the, the souls you're seeking are in the world. Very rare sinners are going to come to the church and say, I need to be saved, delivered, and set free. I need to stop fornicating, lying, selling, dope, smoking, dope. If we had to do a percentage on how many of them do that, you, you may get 0.2%. So he says, go into the world, all right? Then we had the disobedient ones who will fight the government and the government this and the government, they open up the liquor store, but he can open up the church. He can open up the church. What you talking about? The church? See, there you go again with your misguided self. You, you telling us in church, we are the church. But now that they put you out of the church, now we in the church no more. The church is the building. So when God gave the gifts, he gave it to the building. Hey, building, here, yeah, have this gift of healing. Let me see you heal somebody, building. No. So COVID-19 made us see the reality of what we were dealing with all along. It made us take a good perspective of the comedy. That's what I call it. The comedy of what we subscribe to for so long. We begin to see the true colors of some leaders. We begin to see the anger, the rage, the jealousy, the competition, all of this. And the scriptures are clear. The scriptures are clear. And the scriptures makes it very, very clear. And what is that, Kevin? You will know them by their fruit. No, I didn't have to expose you. You did it all on your own. Prophet, prophetess, pastor, bishop, teacher, evangelist. So don't come to me with that. Again, give me the scriptures. That's all I come here for. If I come to your church, I come for the scriptures. I don't hear nothing else but those scriptures. Okay? That's what I come here for. I keep saying this. Church is a place of training. So many people found themselves lost when they couldn't go to the four walls anymore. They didn't know what to do. Now remember now, if church is a place where you train people, then clearly you learned nothing there because you are now uh, destabilized. You're immobile. You don't know what to do. 
You don't know how to pick up the phone or go in the street and witness to somebody. You don't even know what to say to bring somebody to Christ because you're not in the routine of, of clapping and singing and praising and running around and saying glory to God, hallelujah, whether the pastor making sense or not. So you were never taught. So they never did what they were supposed to do. You weren't learning anything. So if Christ were to come now and make an assessment and say, okay, according to my slate here, you were supposed to win uh, under you 4,000 souls. I see none here. You had the gift of healing and deliverance. You had the gift of speaking into their lives and igniting their gifts, stirring up their gifts and causing them to be launched into their ministry. I see none of that. All I saw from based on Christ's records, all I saw is when you sit on your high and, and, and do the routine and the fruitless rituals, nobody was saved. Nobody benefited from that. See, I jumping out the blocks because COVID-19 brought the reality of what I was preaching all along. And it wasn't bashing no church. It wasn't bashing no pastor. That's what you changed the narrative to. What I was simply saying to you then is exactly what I'm saying to you now. We, the believers of Jesus Christ, are called to go into the world, preach the gospel, and bring souls to, to, to Christ's kingdom. That's what we're here for. After the training that we would have gotten in these churches, we are to go out there and to recruit people. That's what we're there for. What have you been saved for 4,000 years for? No, man, get that garbage out of here, man. And anybody who goes back to that deserves whatever they get. Because God has been, God has put the whole world, boy, this was so awesome. God, ain't no devil did that. God put the whole world on time out. Come, you all take a break. Now, re, re evaluate. Take a look at yourself, take a look at your, your calling. Take a look at where you are called to be and where you are now. Make some tweaking. Make some assessments. Okay? So, Because when Christ show up, you can't come with no excuse. You can't come with that foolishness. You got to talk sense because he ain't hearing none of your garbage. So I want to leave that there for now. Get into that a little bit more with my topic today. My topic today is God's economy. And I will begin my series next week on church mafia that's going to run for like about uh three or four parts i'm I, I didn't do it today because i had promised to excuse me cover this teaching on god's economy and i really want to get this in there because i'm going to follow up with this particular teaching as it relates to the reality of tithing but i need to give this teaching here first to set a foundation as it relates to tithing, because there's a lot of people who are, who feel condemned if they don't pay the tithe. There are those who feel they, they should pay it. There are those who feel that they shouldn't pay it. There are, there are many of us who have been indoctrinated with the utter garbage that if you do not pay the tithe, you will not prosper. You are cursed with a curse. And they're basing this on uh, uh, Malachi chapter 10, right? Every time it's time to collect tithe and offering, you know, you, you, they play this record again, just like when it's time to vote, they play the roots thing, you know, to, to kind of get you guilty. And they say to you that, according to that scripture, it's speaking to you that if you don't pay the tithe, you have robbed God. And now you are cursed with a curse. And as a result of that, uh, your whole life in limbo. But he's saying, according to the preachers, you could fix this now. In the way that you could fix it now. Let's read the Bible. Let's look at the scriptures. We could fix this by now bringing all the, the tithing offering or bringing meat into my house or whatever and, and see if I wouldn't open up the windows of heaven, glory to God, and, and pour you out a blessing, hallelujah, that there wouldn't even be room enough for you to get it. So all of us go running up there, away oh, and pay my time, we pay my offering, blah, blah, blah. Now, I want you to tell me, and, and I can be easy on you, we ain't even count you who listening to me on this. You name me on one hand, five people in your church right now. Because when I hear the term, open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there would not even be room enough for you to contain. You know what that's saying to me? That means you're supposed to be living in constant overflow. You're not supposed to be broke, struggling, hustling, borrowing, can't pay your bills, buying, calling you, taking your property. That should not be happening if, according to them, what that scripture said refers to you. So I want you to do a small test for me right now. And I want you to think about five, just five, I can be easy on you. 
Think about five people in your church that you know or you think are paying their tithes. And you could throw yourself in there too. Now you tell me now, seeing that I always bash in you, you tell me, because I, I, I won't be wrong here. This is one time I want to be wrong. <laughs> you tell me if you're living in the overflow. You tell me if you have no concerns financially. In fact, overflow also means that not only am I stable in my finances and my daily living, I am in a position to assist other people. Now, you tell me right now, five people right now, you sit back right now and give you some time, and you tell me five people you could think of in your church right now, right now, who are living in the overflow, based on what they told you about that scripture. All I can hear is crickets. I hear nobody. Five people, only five. <laughs> I, don't make me be like, uh, what do you name now? Uh, uh, Abraham, and when he's bargaining with God about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot was, he said, "Okay, let me, let me let me take it down a little bit." But okay, give me give me give me two then. <laughs> no, let's let's read that scripture, man. Let's let's read it. We read that scripture, and for some reason we forget to read chapter two before we get to chapter three, when the priest, the Levitical priest, was being chastised, and they were the ones the scriptures were speaking to, not to you, not to me. And they were told that because they weren't paying the tithe, they weren't when 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 all of the eleven tribes of, of of Israel was commanded by God to give to the Levitical priesthood. See, I won't go here, but you're causing me to go here today. To give to the Levitical priesthood, the tithe was to go to the Levitical priesthood. And they in turn were supposed to take a tithe from that. They weren't doing that. So they was they were told. Not you, not me, not the other people. They, the priests were told that you were cursed with a curse. You weren't doing it. Your father wasn't doing it. So how did that get to me? So he told the priest, if you would do this, you could fix it. We can fix this. If you do it, now the windows of heaven will open unto you. But I ain't going to go there. That's why I tell you I have to give this teaching now. And then we will get to the tithing on a later day. All right, so without any further ado, but actually before, before, uh, where am I now? Before I take this any further, there's one thing that I have to do here. All right, well, let me get back to that later. Anyway, today we're going to be teaching on the topic called God's Economy. God's economy, and I hope you have a notepad because I'm going to uh, saturate you with a, a whole heap of scriptures because it is imperative that you get this understanding. In fact, one of the reasons why I'm teaching this is because this is something that I did. This is something that I followed, and the results were so uh, phenomenal and beyond my wildest imagination that not only did I teach this in other arenas and platforms, but a lot of my friends, I shared this, this uh, spiritual insight with. They, in turn, followed it, and now they're, I mean, singing the praises as it relates to the Word of God in their lives. And I want to make this also clear that my friends are not only Christians. I do have unsaved friends. And they were some of the loudest ones in all of this who practiced this principle and they begin to see an overflow in their lives. So again, as I've been teaching in so many of my teaching, uh, the principles has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not. You being a Christian or not, it's not a qualifier for you to participate in the rules, the laws, the ordinance, and the principles of God. Again, though, that does not negate the fact that you have to accept Jesus Christ to get into his kingdom. So you could follow the rules and benefit from the rules. However, if you have not met the pre-qualifier of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, and you're saved, if you haven't met that, then uh, for, you would not enter the kingdom of God. Now, you will live a good life here based on the principles that you have followed in whatever regards you're following them in. But again, as it relates to your eternal soul and salvation, 
the, the qualifier for that is what I previously said. You must accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want us to turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 15. Because this is what started my journey on all of this. All right. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 15. And listen to what it says. It says, the rich man's wealth is his strong tower, or this is his confidence. However, it says, and this is what got me. This is the part I really want you to hear. It says, the destruction of the poor is his poverty. And that confused me when I read that. Because in my mind, poverty and poor is the same thing. I always thought that. So when I read this, this scripture didn't make any sense to me. Part B, that is, where it says that the destruction of the poor is his or her poverty. What is destroying the poor? I would think they ain't got no money. So they're poor and they cannot get the resources and so on because these things require uh, the exchange of currency in return for the goods and services that they seek. So in my mind, what you mean, what, I don't get that. What you mean that the destruction, he's saying the thing that is destroying the poor is not them being poor. It is their poverty that's destroying them. And I'm like, but aren't you saying the same thing? Aren't you saying the poor, being poor is destroying the poor? No, 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 no. So what I did is I decided, I said, you know what, let me go. Let me go take a look at the meaning of the word poor. And then let me also look at the meaning of the word poverty. And that's when things really begin to open for me. That's when things, I mean, it was like someone just put just the writing on the wall for me. So to be poor speaks of an economic state, meaning that you have no money. <laughs> that's what it is. You, you are financially depleted. You are financially embarrassed. Your bank accounts are, are, are zero. Do you, some, you don't even have no bank account. So it's speaking about your your state, your financial state, or in terms of the, your, the accessibility to attain resources via the exchange of currency. And what you're lacking here is the currency to get those, again, goods and services. So to be poor speaks of a economic state. Poverty, on the other hand, is a, a psychological, it's a mindset. Now, this can make sense to you right now. For example, a person who is poor all their lives, meaning their economic state, they, 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 they didn't have food sometimes, their lights were turned on because they never had money or the little monies that they had there to make do with whatever it is. So they are physically poor. But guess what happened? Somehow they went and played the lottery and they won $100,000, okay? So therefore, their economic state, meaning they were once poor, they're not poor anymore from an economic point of view. They now have the finances to facilitate the uh, goods and services that they now are in a position to meet whatever requirements for the exchange, meaning they have the money. However, poverty comes in now to their mindset. This is where the poverty comes in now. So what do they do? They now begin to behave like a pauper. What do they do? They want to buy the most expensive cars now, the most expensive tennis and shoes, the most expensive weave. Hold on. You've been poor all these years. Shouldn't you save some of this? Shouldn't you invest some of this? Shouldn't you make sure that you put things in place that you don't ever let poverty roll up on you? I mean, being poor roll up on you again? No, 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 no. So this is where poverty comes in now. Poverty is a mindset. No matter how much money they get, they could receive $36 trillion. And, and they will make the Guinness World Book of Records of spending $36 trillion in two weeks. <laughs> That's what a mindset of poverty does. Even though your physical status has changed in terms of the now tangible cash you have in the bank, well, your mindset did not change with that. We go on somewhere with this. So going back to the scripture based on that definition, it says in Proverbs 10 verse 15, it says the rich man wealth is his strong tower. It's his confidence. However, he's saying the poor are being destroyed by the mindset 
of poverty, meaning that it isn't saying that they're not receiving funds or receiving help or receiving handouts, you know. Oh, no. More than likely, they're getting assistance, okay? However, their state of poverty will become recurring because as the resources come in, because of the way they think, they're going to spend it, spend it, spend it, spend it, do a bunch of foolishness. Oh, I get $100,000 or even a million dollars in the lottery. I can buy mommy a, a $900,000 house by putting my old lady in a night. What? My, my old lady? Are you hooking her right up? So, okay, Dumbo. So if you spend $900,000, we ain't get to tax and VAT and all them things yet, right? So at the end of the day, the $1 million that you won, and by the time you go buy this big house for your ma, who can pay the rent? Sorry, who can pay the, the cable and all of the other incidentals that come? So this is what poverty is. Even though one who was once poor now has wealth. I, I go on some of this. Be patient with me. Okay? I, I have to calm down myself sometimes when I get so excited about these things. All right? So... I want to bring this because this is a religious program. This is the Kevin L.A. Ewing Spiritual Insight Show where we deal with spiritual things because we believe here that the root of all things has its origin or its initiation in the spiritual realm. And in order to figure these things out, we must know the spiritual rules, the spiritual implications, the spiritual ordinance, precepts, and all of these other things to navigate our way in this physical world. If we don't know those things, then we will still continue to go around the same mountain over and over and over and over again, taking the same route and still trying to figure out how we, how come we're still here, All right? So the scriptures are showing us there is a vast difference. Remember now, what we're seeing here isn't coming out of no uh, Fortune 500 book or some economics book. This is the scriptures. And the scriptures are telling us there is a difference between the word poor and poverty. Because the book of Proverbs, which I have a lot of my scriptures from, most of them, more than 90% of them right here, you're going to see one minute he's talking about the poor, the next minute he's talking about poverty. And if you don't know the difference, you think he's talking about the same thing. Hence, you will miss the spiritual insight that's being afforded you in that particular scripture. All right? So this is why, let's, let's bring this home to the church now, because this is where I'm going. Let's bring this home to the church, okay? When we have people coming to the church, prophets, whoever, and they're saying to you, I see where there are going to be five millionaires in here. That may be true. I'm not discounting that. That may be true. But the five so-called millionaires are, at, the, at the point now in the church, they're poor, meaning they do not have the resources to do the things that they would want to do. So they're poor. Now, even though they're poor, and there's nothing wrong with being poor. That's, that's, that's a part of life. You don't, if, you, if you do what you need to do, you wouldn't be in that state for the rest of your life, particularly if you follow the scriptures. Now, they're telling you, they're telling you that, that you're going to be wealthy. You, you're going to be rich. And, and you put your hand up because you feel you're one of those people. Okay? Now, you're being set up, not by the preacher, not by the apostle, not by the, the prophet. You're being set up here by the enemy and yourself because if you feel you're going to come into a million dollars, then why aren't you doing courses or getting information on, you know, if I were to get that right now, what is the best way to invest that? What, what is the best thing to do? You're not going to do that. Now, let me tell you what you would do. You, you're going to do with the spirit of poverty. It's going to make you do like he's make everybody else done who've had the money. And now end right back in the same position again. So this is the things you want to do. And the things that he's going to make you do is going to sound so religious, so right. Boy, if I get a million dollars right now, boy, let me tell you something, boy. I, I First of all, I buy me a, a church bus. I buy a church. I, boy, look here. I can let pastor know now, but I buy me a 40-seater for the church. See, because now you think you're doing a righteous deed. And pastor was billing this billing for so long, but I gave him pastor about 600 grand off the top. Now, that's the same point. So you don't pay time now. You don't, you don't take 10% out of, the, out of the $100 you make every week. But all of a sudden, you can have this great epiphany and give pastor, let him have a whole million. And I would love to meet that pastor you can give it to because that has to be a miracle when that happened. If you ain't paying $10 out of the $100, you telling me now that if you get a million dollars, you can give him 100000 
Now that I gotta see. <laughs> no, seriously. Now I not that there. Now to me, that would be the eighth wonder of the world right there. I need to see that. Because what you don't know is that poverty accompanied with your former poor state has conditioned you to be a consumer, or condition you to, to, to ball, to live the life, not thinking about the future, not securing things now so that you don't return to this position in the future. You're not thinking that. And you've been conditioned to do that. I'm going to show you where the church had a lot to do that also. I can hear them now. This man is blaming the church for everything. <laughs> Y'all need to go get safe. Go get the living set free. Because <laughs> I'm trying to set the people free. I'm trying to get you to prepare for what you believe or what has been prophesied to you that's coming. If not, you will find yourself in the very same position that you now despise. So, let's look at some scriptures now. Uh, well, let's, let me make some definitions here. Poverty, I wrote this down. Poverty is the overall state of uh, depending on a system or a or more or less a welfare system. Like, you don't make up in your mind, and I met a lot of people like this. They borrow and borrow and borrow from the bank. They borrow to pay the children's school fee. They borrow to pay off another loan from another bank. And when you talk to them, this is what they say to me. Well, Kevin, I come in the world borrowing. I can leave borrowing. My ma borrow. My daddy borrow. See, li listen, listen to the poverty mindset. See, the poverty mindset ensure that you stay poor. It's a spirit. I and mean, we can see that today. Kevin, I don't know what you're tripping for. You only live once. Saving this money in the bank, you don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's sickness will come now and wipe out all that money. That's true. But at least I got money there for it to wipe out. And at least I can get some services from the doctors and so on before all go. Unlike you have nothing, if, if something grand happened to you now, first they need five, six thousand dollars to airlift you. You don't have that. Well, they want eighty thousand dollars for the heart surgery. You have to do nothing near that. So stop trying to justify your ignorance. Stop justifying your position as if this is how this is what God called you to be. Uh uh. So poverty is an overall state of uh, economic dependency where one is dependent on a system of care for all or most areas of their lives. Social services, you know. And how do you justify? Well, I I need to pay my tax. You need to take national insurance. So see, rather than you run all that nonsense, why are you not thinking how I'm going to make my life better? So what do you do? What do you do? How do we get this to the church now, Kevin? What do you do? What is your backup plan? And we're talking to the believers now. So what the believers are conditioned to do, and they've been subliminally, whether they believe it or not, trained to be this way. You've been trained that if you sow seeds. God is going to make you rich. If you sow seeds, a sack of money is going to fall from the heavens and almost break your neck. You have been conditioned that no matter what happened in this world, don't put your trust in your bank account. Oh, hallelujah. Don't put your trust in this. You need to take a risk and step out in faith and sow that seed. Sometimes God wants you to remember the woman with the might. She gave of her last. Some of you, God is probably saying to you, take that rent money and, 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 and test God. Listen, you're being set up like a dummy. Just listen. They're teaching you to be irresponsible. They're teaching you not to prioritize your life. But no trust God nonsense. There are many other ways you could trust God. You have an obligation with that landlord. You have an obligation with those bank notes that you have. When you sit in there and you sign on the dotted line where you made an agreement that every month at this time or before, you will make this note payment. But you let this guy come in here and then put you back on the rest. I hear God saying to some of y'all right now that, that, that the mortgage man, the, you, you, you are a, 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 a slave to the lender. Hallelujah. Then there's some churches who, who are constructing and are telling their members to go to the bank and get a loan. Or some of them saying, or, or max with your credit card, test God. I tell you, boy, I come to knock it straight in the bush today. No fear here because I've sat on the ministries like that, where most of those people today are broke, busted, disgusted. 
They don't know where the next dollar coming from, the investments that they would have made in the synagogue of devils. Never panned out. Do you know why? Because it was never the laws of God. But I'm about to give you those laws today. God wants you to be responsible. Most businesses will tell you. Some churches and some Christians who have accounts with them, their account is off or they are, uh, uh, they, what's the word I'm looking for you now? They're, they're delinquent in payments. The believers, the Christians, the one who prancing on the pulpit every day, flipping backwards, swinging on the, the chandeliers. These are the ones who, who, who fill with the Holy Ghost and know Christ and all this nonsense, but you cannot meet your commitments. You, you are not committed to the agreement that you made with that hardware store, with, 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 with the bank or whatever. So your way out of this, rather than being shrewd with your affairs, your way out of this is, I, 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 let me sow a seed into pastor's life. Let me, let me put this in Kevin's life, or let me, let me, or let me, let me, let me think of something what I could do so God could give favor. I me. Mean, God ain't gonna do nothing for you until you follow His rules. Follow the rules. All right. Now, let's look at Proverbs chapter ten and verse four. Oh, I coming in. I coming in rough today. I I don't I don't have my little break with COVID. Proverbs chapter ten verse four. Listen to what it says. It says, "He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand." Hey Kevin, let me see if that's right. That's what it said. That's what I'm reading here. He how did he become poor? Oh, this is one of the avenues. It says because he dealt with a slack hand, he never sat down and and, and analyzed and and scrutinized his financial affairs. He just give to everybody and, uh, you know, uh, you can't hold this up for yourself. No, 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 there are rules. It says, he becometh poor that dealeth with a, la with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent will make him rich. You want to listen to this? They ever preach this to church in y'all? To, to church to, to you in church? Because this is what you need to be listening to if you were prophesied to that you're going to come into money or God is going to bless you financially. You need to prepare. How do you prepare? Go to the law. Go to the rules. Because if you get these rules I'm about to tell you now in your system, then whenever that will come, whenever the transfer from the wicked to the well come over, you will be well prepared. And a lot of you ain't getting that transfer yet because God already knows it can send you straight to hell. Because you have no scriptural, spiritual knowledge as it relates to the economy of God. Get out of that garbage. So Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. You know you got rent to pay. You know the school fee coming up. But you in the line on the weave store going to buy these five, six hundred dollar weave when you notice your rent money. You notice your children lunch money. Huh? The fellow over here won't buy F-150. You know, yeah, you qualify for the loan, but you know you're going to be paying this loan for the next 10 years. You won't get your house yet. You won't secure your family yet. Oh, I can buy pasta. I buying pasta on F-150. I ain't stopping you from pasta, buying pasta. Nothing, you know. I ain't stopping you from buying nobody. Nothing. Have you sat down and became acquainted with your financial state? And not just now, but as it relates to your goals in the future. So what I'm saying to you, yeah, the prophecy may be true. I discount the prophecy that you can become a gazillionaire. I am knocking none of that. I don't know that God talking to them. I wasn't there. What I am saying to you, though, are you prepared? And COVID-19 showed a lot of you that you're not prepared. COVID-19 showed you that all that money you was given to the church, all of the first fruit, last fruit, the third fruit, every fruit, uh, this seed, Palm Sunday seed, Uncle Tom's seed, Billy Goat seed, Crocodile seed, every seed you have sown, you've made others rich. So where your return is. Because all I'm going to ask you, where did you see it in the scriptures? Other than the scriptures that you were given to mislead you to give to them. Say, so I know the pastors gave me, and I know they can come for me, but you can come because, and I keep telling you, if you're coming, you better come with the word. Because Kevin don't listen to nothing if you ain't bringing the word, if we're discussing these things like this. And, you, and if you upset, you are upset because what I am saying is true. And if you say that I'm a liar, then you're calling God boy to lie because this is where I'm getting it from. Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. He has no uh, uh, accountability for his income. He, he's not, he's not uh, 
are putting it in places to to and in terms of the future is concerned. But it says the one that is rich or the one that will become rich, he deals with a diligent hand. He isn't foolish. He realized he have three, four kids. He realized he has a wife. He realized that they're in an apartment now, but I want to put them in a home one day. So if I die, you know, at least they will have a home. He want to get some insurance. He may not have a home right now. He got married. And if something were to happen, his wife will not have anything. So you know what he says? You know what? Let me go buy some insurance. I'm going to open up a big policy. So in the event that if something happened to me, then my wife will have enough money to go get a house on her own or take care of the children or send them whatever to call. At least when I did, I didn't leave them in debt. But oh no, that ain't what you're doing. You're jumping around all day. Oh, Jesus is a deliverer. And then you're putting in your money, throwing it up all on the altar. Pastor preaching, but something. You throw all your money up there. So you go put that money in the bank. Now let me be clear here now. Let me be clear. I am not saying to you don't give to the church. We, we can get down to that. Okay, because I know when you get guilty, you will try to change my narrative. But I did. I never said that. Okay, what I am, and I will get to what you think I'm saying. But my point here is, you have to be diligent. You, because the Bible say it didn't say the Lord was diligent. No, it says that the man who became rich was diligent in his financial dealings, and that made him rich. He prioritized. He never lived above his means. He never hung his basket high and he could reach it. Okay? He put things in place. Many of you, if God bless you right now with a million dollars, I can hear you right now in the spirit. I can hear you right now. Oh, I got to give Mary. I can give Mary 5000 and And cousin Tom, oh, Lord, I sure don't treat him right. I can give him 50000 Listen to these big figures you call it. And they are also financially undisciplined. So by the time you give them that, they can bust it up. And where you think they're coming back when they done bust it up? Oh, Brother Kevin, I know you only gave me $80 million today, but oh, Lord, the devil busy. Jesus, Lord, I ain't got no more of that. You don't think you got another $80 million you can lend me? Eh? <laughs> Boy, look here. Buddy? <laughs> Boy, listen, this this here, this hitting home today. I don't care. This hitting home today because this is, this is the state we are living in today. Many of us are a, a, a paycheck away from poverty. And Corona proved that when the job lets you go or when you heard rumors that they're cutting some people, boom, fear coming to you now. Now, my you's making some big salaries, four or $5,000 a month. But you thought I was going to go on forever, so you never secured for the future. But, but. Even though you didn't secure, I better go in the yard, you get all kind of Mercedes and, and Hummers and, and all kind of, especially when they just had the Hurricane Dorian thing and, and the duty-free vehicles, you bring in all these big expensive stuff because you didn't have to pay duty. You drain your bank account because you need to let the world know that, buddy, look here, y'all are running in this old breakup right on uh, 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 Honda and Toyota. I got me a Hummer. That time the insurance is $66 trillion, right? The maintenance order is $4 trillion a year. All because I need to let the world know I live in. So I tell them, you only live once. But according to this law, it says you will become poor because you're dealing with a slack hand. That's what I'm reading here. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 7. And what does it say? It says... There is that making himself rich, yet he has nothing. There is that making himself poor, yet he have great riches. Now, let me explain this to you. It starts off by saying that there is a person that makes himself rich, but he has nothing. That's the person I just was telling you about. They're going to get all of the, the things that uh, is interpreted that I'm rich. So for me to fool my co-workers and my family members and friends, I'm going to... Go to the bank and I'm going to, I, I could qualify, I qualify for $40,000. So I'm going to buy a, a Mercedes or a BMW or a Jaguar. I'm going to get that. So the Bible says, I'm making myself to a parish. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to, my bank note is like $1,000 a month on this car, all right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to live or rent in a high rise area. I'm going to get a condominium. Right, so I'm going to get a condominium and the rent there is like almost $1,500 for a studio apartment. But they don't know I live in a studio, so when I tell them I live in the condominium, 
they'd be like, so they're going to automatically think it's a big condominium with plenty rooms because the Jaguar, the car that I have, will cause them to think that way. Then I'm going to buy me some fake Rolexes and some rings, and I'm going to just deplete myself because I want to give the impression that I live like a king. Well, let me see what the scripture says about that. In Proverbs 13, verse 7, it says, This person is making themselves to be rich or giving the appearance to others that they are rich. But the next part of the scripture says, yet they have nothing. Zero. When they draw their salary every Monday, 4,000 salary, they 3,000, 2,000. Let's say 4,000 they draw in a month. Okay? By the time all of the banks and all of the credit union, they wouldn't take their period, they may carry home on two, three hundred dollars. But you don't know that. So you tell the man, listen, let's just go to Miami this weekend. Well, I ain't into Miami, man. I ain't into that, man. I's a man living in my condo, but I ain't got time for that. No, you got time for that. Just that you can't go there. <laughs> okay? Because you don't deplete all your money. So the Bible says, there is that person that make themselves rich, yet have nothing. But I like the second part. However, there is he that making himself poor, yet have great riches. Now, who is this guy? This is the guy who got some monies in the bank. But he said, I don't need a fancy car. That don't make no sense. Let me get a nice little Honda or a little Toyota. Once the AC and stuff working, I good to go. I just need to get from point A to point B because I got a greater goal. So I'm going to save my funds and continue to save them. I'm going to live my life. I ain't going to, you know, be an old hoarder or, or live like a pauper. You know, I still going to live good. But I, all of these big ticket items, I don't need that right now. I know what I want to do. I want to secure a home debt free. So I figure when I calculate, if I was to get a loan and pay the bank every month this amount of money over these amount of years, if I got a $100,000 loan, just say it, and they give me 20 years, I would have paid them back $300,000. So they would have made $200,000 profit off me. But what if I decide to cut back on my expenses and the monies I would have been paying the bank? Let me pretend as if I'm paying the bank now by securing that money every month. So what, you know what? And I could take some side jobs to keep my little car, keep my little shirt and pants. You know, I put no no expensive jewelry. I don't need all that right now. Let me just live within my means. But I save my money because I'm looking at the future. So boom, a couple of years later, I'm in a position now that, hey, something went down. And this duplex is for sale or this house. And the, the people just want to get rid of it in good condition. And they want $70,000. Wow, that's a steal. That's a deal. Yes, that's a deal. But that ain't no deal to you if you don't have $70,000, right? However, the guy who's living within his means, who's been saving all this time, he says 70000 I tell you what, I'll give you sixty grand cash right now. Well, the bank don't want it on their books. They're not into real estate. They just won't get it off. 60000 is yours. So the guy who's living the little mediocre life, who everybody judge, look at him riding around his old breakup right hand on the old Lord. Oh, Lord, you, give me, you can't tell me you've been living, working all these years. You can't buy yourself a nice Mercedes. Well, you did. And you barely live in. So the scriptures are clear. It says here, it says, There is this person that making himself poor or give the appearance to others that he is poor. The Bible says, Yet he have not just riches, yet he have great riches. Because of his shrewdness and seeing in the future and whatever he does now, what he's doing now is totally based on his future goal. On the other hand, the baller, he is now, he, 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 he want to be rich, so he's given the appearance now by depleting all the resources that he has now. That's scripture, that ain't my opinion. Let's look at verse 8 of that same scripture. It says, the ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor hear it not rebuke. They ain't hearing you. Mary, listen, listen. Think about this, Mary. You just draw $200 $210 minimum wage every week, all right? Why every week you go in and, and these Solomon them buying these expensive caviar and all this foolishness and leave you with nothing? And every, every month you come to me to borrow money, every month. Well, it ain't like that. You no, know, no, it's like that. Well, the, first of all, don't tell me how to run my show. Well, you don't beg me for no money. You're all about getting on people business, judging people. You're all about judging people. I ain't judging you. I ain't said nothing to you. I simply said. So this is what the scripture means when it says, but the poor hear it, not rebuke. 
You're trying to show them how to not be in this position. You're trying to show them how to not circle this mountain again. Instead, they become offended. Instead, they now go say, who do you think he is? He think he's better than me. But when did I say that to you? I am every week. In fact, every month I can time you when you're going to come and tell me things tough and if I can help you. I can basically time when you're going to come. I'm saying to you, you don't have to live in this embarrassing state if you follow this simple advice. But according to the scripture, this isn't Kevin. According to the scripture, it says that the poor, they are not interested in your advice. They are not interested in your rebuke. But why? Well, let's go back to the, the, the poverty mindset again, because poverty is the spirit. It is to keep you thinking a certain way to ensure your economic status of being poor. You See, if that thinking doesn't change, then that stronghold of poverty is on you. You are going to think one way over and over only to secure the same results you've been getting time and time again. That's scripture. Let's look at verse 23 of the same chapter, chapter 13. Verse 23 says, Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Now, isn't that powerful? The Bible says the poor got a lot of resources, you know. See, but where they're thinking, they have one way of thinking. I know I have a lot of friends who are carpenters and masons, but they're poor. What you, how come you're poor? How come you're struggling? How could that be? You're in a position you don't even have to work for somebody. You could work for yourself. You could schedule your own jobs. You could just begin to budget your money, take on jobs, save your money, open up your own business, do whatever it is. No, he's not going to do that. You know why? Because every time they got the trade, they get all of that. Every time they make money, the spirit of poverty say, boy, now look here. You know you got a ball this weekend. Come on, man. You're going to party the whole week. If you don't believe me, every Friday when it's payday, go to any liquor store. Any liquor store. And watch those fellows who did construction in the sun all week. Huh? That Brylin sun on that roof laying shingles. Only to get that three four hundred dollar check to go straight to the liquor store and spend all that money right now. It's a spirit, a spirit of poverty. Remember, to be poor is an economic state. That means that that could be temporal. That don't have to be forever. But poverty speaks of a state of mind where in your mind I'm going to be dependent on borrowing from Kevin. I'm going to be dependent that no matter what happened in my life financially, I always got John over here to lean on. I, I got social services. I got welfare to lean on. So in your mind, you've already made up. I'm not interested in securing my own destiny when there are so many other of my friends I could depend on. So there's much tillage in the poor. There's many things that the poor have within their reach to change their circumstances, but they choose not to do it because of the mindset that they have. And that's why churches need to be teaching their members economic sense. In my opinion, every church should have somebody on board who they should be paying to teach their members how to budget, to teach their members that if money ever do come in your life, these are the areas that you invest in. This is how you secure for your children, your grandchildren. This is how you put things in place. Not, oh, when God bless me, I can give pastor this, I can give Jerry this, I can give Tom that. No, no, because they ain't going to do it. I tell you that right now. There are many people... Who said to me, Kevin, listen, I come into something, man, and man, listen, you've been so good. I can bless. And the first thing I say, listen, you don't have to do that. Why are you doing this? Because I try to say, I right, listen, I don't want you to rack up no sins here, man. I know you won't do it. So in so much ways, I say, no, you don't got to bless me. You don't got to do it. No, 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 Kevin. No, no, no. Listen, they can tell me. You won't stop my blessing. No, uh-uh. So they came into what they came into. You think I saw them? <laughs> I might have saw uh, them on Facebook, but I see them in person, and I'm mad at them because I was trying to discourage them from day one because I've been this road before. I know how a person who have a poverty mindset think. See, before that money come, they're the most humble people. They, they really want to do the right thing. But when that money come, they're a whole new different person. But I'm mad at them. All that's saying to me is you need to be delivered from the spirit of poverty. That's all they're telling me. Let's look at Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14, verse 20. Proverbs 14 and verse 20. And listen to what it says. It says, the poor is hated even of his own neighbor 
but the rich have many friends. Why? Why is this? For the obvious reasons. A poor person is always in a lax state, and they're always asking and begging for something. Nobody wants to be around them. But the rich man have plenty of friends. Why? He have plenty of friends because he always have. He ain't begging nobody for nothing. He ain't harassed you. Really. Oh, yeah, man. I'm glad you come here, man. Boy, only God could send you here. Boy, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know how to say this to you, man. But listen, I really, oh, glory to God. I really need my $500 right now. I need my $500 right now. You think people want to be around that person? No. So the scriptures, and I'm going to little you with them today, the scriptures are just going to give you all sorts of stuff about the poor and their, literally their behavior, the, their poverty. Let's look at another one. Let's look at verse 21, the next one. It says, he that despised his neighbor sin it, but he that have mercy on the poor, happy is he. Now, this is good because it's going to take us coming down to the end of my teaching where I'm going to show you that when it comes to giving, if you truly want to be financially in a position to, to, to be financially uh, uh, free, your, your wealth is tied up in the lives that are less fortunate. And I'm going to give you my testimony on this just before I conclude this, this teaching. All right? <clears throat> Let's go to uh, Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19 and verse 17. Proverbs 19 in verse 17, listen to what it says. It says, he that pity the poor, he that hath pity on the poor, lend it unto the Lord. And that which he had given, will he pay him again. So, this is powerful. This is what I was trying to get to. You see, the poor, Scripture says to us, will be with us always. And in a sense, this is kind of beautiful because... God has set up rules in his system that when you invest in the life of those that are less fortunate than you, then you're setting up yourself for wealth. Not only that, it is not only limited to wealth. When you consider or assist those that are less fortunate, you're also protecting yourself from danger, future problems. And even things that you have done and you should be judged on it or checked on it or lock up or whatever, the simple act of giving to those that are less fortunate than you could cause you to be favored in a time when you rightfully deserve the punishment, not to get the punishment. The Bible says to us in Proverbs, in Job, I think chapter 14, verse 1, I believe it is. I stand to be corrected. And it says that a man that is born of a woman are a few days. Their time here is limited, very brief. And they are filled with trouble. So this is a, this is a given. So they, they, no one should pop up on this, right? And at a mature age and say, I will never experience trouble in my life. They are, they, are, they are crazy. Because the scripture has made it clear that trouble will be the inevitable. But we could address that trouble prior to us ever encountering it. And let me give you another scripture on this. So let's go to, let's go to Psalms. Let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 41. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 3. All right? I'm just giving you the rules. I'm showing you biblical principles. And I know I have the attention of many of you listening to me right now and even watching me on social media. And I want you to see, these are not my opinion. This isn't my rules. This is something I have studied, and I have done it, and I have seen it happen in my life. Psalms 41, beginning at verse 3, it says, uh, Bless is he that considers the poor, or assists the poor, where he realized that, boy, listen, who could I bless today? Lord, lead me to someone. This wealth, I want to sustain this. I, I want to remain wealthy. I don't ever want to be poor again. I don't ever want to come to the point where I can barely take care of my children, or I can barely meet my financial obligations. So Father, because I understand the principle of investing in those that are less fortunate, Father, point me to someone today to bless. Because that's the position I in, and I will give you my story at the end of this. So he says, it says, bless is the man. He is automatically blessed for the mere fact that he's considering to bless somebody. Bless is the man that considers the poor. Now watch the benefits. Oh man, I love this. I love this so much. 
This is awesome because I am not reading here. Bless is the Christian that consider the poor. Bless is the teacher Kevin that consider the poor. No. Bless is the bishop, the apostle. No, I did not read that. This is a, a, a general law to all and sundry that participates in it. If the Satanist, the voodoo worker, the adulterer, the liar participate in this, he or she will receive the same benefits. I love it. So the scripture makes no discrimination. It says, blessed is this one that considers the poor. Now watch the benefits. One, the Lord will deliver him in his time of trouble. You mean only because I give to the poor? Because I was looking, because I saw that guy by the bank begging for money or when I was driving and came to the stoplight, the guy knocked on my windshield and asked me for a couple of dollars. Listen, I didn't make the rules, buddy. That's what it's saying. Bless is he that considers the poor. And the first thing it says that the Lord, because of that, will help you in your time of trouble. Verse 2. The Lord will preserve you. That's the second promise. Meaning that he will keep you. He will protect you. The third one it says, and he will keep you alive. The meaning you ain't going to die before your time. All right? So when they tell you put the red cloth, they tell them you're into the red cloth because you're investing in the poor. You're following the word, not this clown over here. So the, the, the next thing he said, and he shall bless, he shall be blessed upon the earth. So how much promises we got so far? Number one. It says the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. That's number one. Number two, the Lord will preserve him. Okay, that's number two. Number three, the Lord will also keep him alive. Mm -hmm. Number four, the poison shall be blessed upon the earth. Okay. Number five, thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Mind you, he's deserving of it. Mind you, he might have did something where the enemies have a legal right to shut him down. But God says, whether you're a sinner or Christian, because you were, when I led you to bless so-and-so when they were in need, because you considered them, these are the promises that's going to envelop your life, whether you save or not. Lord, I, I love in this. He says, and thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. He ain't finished. Watch verse 3. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing or on his bed of sickness. God says, I'm going to empower you. God says, I'm going to raise you up from the sickness. Thou will make all his bed in his sickness. My Lord, you all listen to this? Are you all listening to this? So God, you telling me if the witchcraft worker, of the adulterer is blessing people and helping the poor and so on and so forth, you tell me all these promises he will receive? So this is making sense to me now. I always used to wonder why this wicked dude, every time he do wickedness for some way, somehow, he always seemed to slip out of the trouble. But then I find out later, as wicked as he is, he's a giver. He blesses people who are in a less... I didn't know he used to be around the ghetto giving out money. I didn't know he used to anonymously pay people mortgage. And I didn't know that. All I know him to be is a crooked person who raw people and so on. That's how I always know him to be. I had no idea, neither did he, that when he was helping the poor, he was participating in a rule that would secure his destiny even though he is deserving of what's supposed to be coming to him. My God, man, listen, this 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 is more teaching today. Mighty Lord. Oh Lord, this is good. I love it. So as we can see here, the wealth, your wealth, y'all ready for this? It ain't giving your offering. It ain't paying no time. There's no scripture that will show you that you will become wealthy if you pay the time. Now I and I'm not telling you don't pay no time, no offering. I'm not telling you don't give to your pastor or bless your minister or bless your apostle. I'm not telling you that. What I am telling you, though, I'm giving you a little secret now. Those same single mothers on your bench every Sunday, that same fellow who's played the guitar in the church, who you know got financial troubles, who God been tugging on your heart all this time, that same young lady there who only 17 and got a young baby and the man leave her, and she got to compromise her body to make ends meet. When God was talking at child and say, go bless her with one hundred dollars every every time you get paid, or, or or go buy one car for her so she don't have to sell her body for a guy to take her from point A to that same person. That's where your wealth was tied up. That's where your protection was tied up. Because God said, when you consider the poor, hello, 
He said he will preserve you. He will keep you alive. He will not surrender you unto your enemies. So the truth is, let's get some more revelation now. You've been on your knees, God, Lord, I really need to get a home to put my wife and family in. Father, I pray, Lord, I want to help my children go to college, God. It can't happen on the $300 a week salary, Lord. I pray for a breakthrough. This is the Christian now. This is the Christian prayer. Father, Lord, turn it around for me. But nobody, nobody has taught him the principles on giving. The true giving. Now, I'm not talking about no offering and sow seed garbage. I'm talking about according to the scriptures as I'm about to even give you more. No one has taught him this. So because he doesn't know this, because he doesn't know the principles of investing in the poor, now just when he finished praying and fasting for the Lord to do these things for him, he received a phone call. Brother, Brother Kev, what's up, man? Yeah, man, everything good, man. Boy, I just was here praying, man. And it's amazing that you just calling me. I just got up off my knees, man. You know, you're reaching out to God for some stuff. Yeah, 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 man. I hear that, I hear that, man. Listen, Brother Kev, you know I don't do this. I had a job. And I, or I need you to just lend me $200 till the month end. Now, I got $1,000. But immediately I take an attitude. My ties we were begging me, my goodness, man. I don't want it. Now, God setting you up. God has just created an avenue for you to participate in his law because you're asking him for something. He wants to release it. But now this guy who in a lacking position, a poor state economically, and God already said in his word, if you consider the poor, if you give to the poor, if you lend to the poor, you're lending to me and I can pay you back. But you don't know those rules. You don't know those rules. So guess what you do now? Boy, Brother Kev, boy, I hear you. I hear I and. I hear you, but boy, I can be real with you, man. I got that right now. You know, I can't. I, I, you know, I will lie to you. I will put myself in that position. I, I ain't there, man. Okay, man, everything cool. So now you go to church next week. They have a uh, break every chain service. And the fellow come down from wherever he come from. And now he goes off into the divine. I hear the Lord say, on my way flying here to the Bahamas. Glory, hallelujah. 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 You hear that low voice? You better take out that, pick, that, that, that checkbook. You better take out your wallet because you know it's coming. And, and, and God said to me, I hear God say that there, there are five people in here that has a thousand dollars and there's something special that he does with a thousand. Oh, hallelujah. Now, mind you, the words say, if you give to the poor, is this dude poor? Huh? Is this church poor? Huh? Jesus Christ is saying to you in his word, he is saying no give to them, you know. He is showing you how to change your uh, poor state. He's showing you what you need to invest in. He is showing you, but you've been trained all your life. This break chain service, conclave, this way you do this. No, that ain't, I, there is no scripture that says if I give to the pastor, if I give to the church, if I pay my tithe, if I give my offering, God is going to bless me. God is going to stop my enemies from attacking me. Show me the scripture that says that. Show it to me. As, is Kevin discouraging you from giving the tithe? No. Is Kevin saying do not give your pastor no money? No. I'm not saying that. What I am showing you, though, is biblically based rules as it relates to changing your financial status. And it is going to begin in investing in the lives of those that are less fortunate than you, not those who are already in the position. That's all I say to you. That's all I say to you. Now, you can twist that however you want to twist it. Now, let's look at some more scripture. Let's look at some more scripture. <clears throat> let's look at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 13. Proverbs 22 and verse 13. It says, a slothful man or a lazy man or a lackadaisical man. He says, the slothful man say, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the street. In so much word, what is saying here in that little sentence is that the lazy person Always have an excuse. Always have an excuse to why they should not apply themselves, why they should not use their gifts, why they should not participate in the laws of God. Always got an excuse. But when you bring a little something outside of the Bible, something that seems like a get-rich-quick scheme, 
That's why I don't fall for none of them. I don't be into none of those pyramid garbage. I ain't into none of that. I follow in the rules of the scriptures. I ain't saying they don't work, you know. I Again, let me be clear. This is my opinion in this regard as it relates to those things. I ain't telling you don't go buy your carrot gold. I ain't telling you don't go do none of that. I ain't discounting none of them people. What I am saying to you, though, for me, I will follow the scriptures. My carrot gold is in the poor people. That's where, that's where I can invest to get my carrot gold back. I ain't saying your carrot gold ain't going to work. But based on the scriptures, and this is just another example where I've been telling you all along, people are so, anyone could come to them and say, listen, uh, this is uh, uh, Peter Pan uh, uh, Burroughs. Peter Pan Burroughs is a Harvard graduate. He has his master's degree in economics and given all these titles. Peter, Grant, Peter Pan Burroughs has come up with this strategy and he's saying that if you invest $100 into this, uh, what we're doing here, and then you bring two people on board, and then two people come underneath you, and the more people they bring on board, then we're going to give you little trickles, but all y'all going to make me rich to the top. Oh, boy, you hear that, Kev? But Kev, I enter that bag and take my mic in there. Yeah, but I see on here, if you consider the poor, now let's look at what God promises are. Nobody will hear that. That's why the scripture I gave you earlier, the poor don't want nobody rebuking them. The poor don't want nobody advising them. Don't tell me what to do, Kevin. Okay? But yet I won't borrow from you, and yet I won't help me in my time of need. So the scriptures are clear. All I'm saying to you, who are you going to go with now? Are you going to go with God, or are you going to go with all these other things? And again, let me be clear. I ain't saying these other things don't work. I tell you don't go into these other things, you know. I telling you for me, and those who have ears to hear, follow the rules of God. That's all I'm saying to you. There's nothing for you to be offended about. Follow the rules of God. All right? Now, Proverbs 22 and verse 7. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. What does it say? The rich rule it over the poor, which is right. And the borrower is serving to the who? The lender. Listen, being economically poor will always place you in a borrowing state. That's it. And you will always be subject to those who you borrow from. Can't cop no attitude with them. No, you gotta you you made an you made an agreement. And this is why I'm saying to you, the scriptures are littered. The scriptures are littered with all of this stuff. And I got a whole heap of scriptures here, but I just want to squeeze in my little testimony here for you. And then we're going to carry on because I see time kind of eluding us, right? I said to you, in 2012, I left the church building, okay? I walked away from organized religion, okay? I never categorized myself as a Baptist, a Pentecostal, an Anglican, or none of that. Because even in my junior years of my walk with God, when I read Matthew 12 and 25... Uh, denomination spells division to me. And according to that scripture, any kingdom or house that is divided against itself shall fall. When Jesus Christ uh, laid his rules out and he left, he left one body. Somewhere along the line, someone get up in their head and say they don't agree with this one and they don't agree with that one. So he said, we can be Baptist, we can be Pentecostal. I don't believe in that. Okay? I have no commitments, or subscriptions to denominations. Now, again, let me be clear. If that's you, I ain't knocking you. I'm telling you what Kevin ain't into. So when someone say, well, who, which denomination you are? Denomination, I am a child of God. I am an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. When I die and stand before the gate for them to check that record, see my name on there, they're not going to look under Baptist. They're not going to look under Pentecostal. They're not going to look under Methodist. Again, this got nothing to do with you. There's no reason for you to get offended, all right? So when I left the church building, because it was my time to leave, the Lord told me, Kevin, it's time to leave. It was nothing personal, nothing against no pastor, no beef, no nothing. I left because it was it for me. I have been to a couple churches prior to that I was a member of, all right? I got my training. I sat on the pastors, apostles. I studied the word. Now that I was trained, it was time for me to go. All right? Some got poisoned, some took it poisoned. That on them. I ain't mad with you. 
I now doing what I do now, which I was trained to do. Now, when I left there from 2012 to now 2020, okay, that's how much? Eight years, right? I have never paid a tithe. Never. I have never been, been a part of no church since then and said every time I got paid, I went to a church building and gave them 10% of my, never did it. Never did it since then. Eight years later, never did it. Never did it. However, within those eight years, my financial status changed basically overnight. Not only that, I owed no one. I was able to pay off whatever bills I had and whatever this I was dealing with, I was able to knock all of that out. Now, how was this happening? I still got the same job, okay? Still on the job at the time. How come this is happening when while I was paying the tithe, I was always broke, I was always struggling, I was always hoping that some way, somehow, somebody could walk up to me and give me $10,000, $20,000, whatever, and I'm able to take care of these bills and, and, and pay this off. But how, how come when I was paying the tithe and paying the offering, I was more broke and that I am not experiencing that right now. Well, let me tell you what the difference was. Even though I used to be paying the tithe and the offering, there were a lot of things because I was always a study of the scriptures that didn't make sense to me, especially when it comes to the tithe. And let me be clear here again. I got to make my disclaimers because I know this can ruffle some feathers. This is Kevin's personal view in terms of what he did according to the laws of God. And Kevin got the benefit of what the laws of God promise. So what happened? After I, what did I do? I, every time I got paid, every time I was given uh, monies, when I went away to do teaching, when I was blessed with someone, whenever that happened, even to this day, my wife and I have a slate of people who we're going to bless. That's the first thing we do. And there are people do, that we have on, on a list right now that we assist every month. Not in nobody's business. That's between us and them. Nobody else knows this. Where we assist them. We made an agreement. Some we do for six months. Some we do for a year. And there's several people that we do this with. What that has done is that more monies begin to come in when we start to do this. And I'm, I'm talking about what I call surprise money. It just come. People just bless. People just give. But as we give, we already set aside. Okay, now this this couple of times can go here. This can go here. Then there are churches and there are ministries that God has laid upon our heart. We would call them and say, this is what the Lord said. And we want to bless your ministry. We've done this for several ministries. We make it very clear. We don't want no fanfare. We don't want none of that. This, If you choose to do that on you, but this is between us. When that started, I'm talking about when I tell you between the money's coming and the favor, it was it was incredible. All right? As a result of that, we were able to do a lot of things that we couldn't do before. So I'm saying to myself, how was it? I paid the tithe. They told me that when I paid the tithe, because I was thiefing from God, like we see in the Bahamas, I was robbing God, according to them. And because I was robbing him, that's why I was cursed with a curse. That's why I was broke. That's why nothing was happening for me. So I paid more. I paid more tithe. I give more offering. Every time the charlatans come over and they say, God said, if five of you all buy this vial of voodoo oil, then you're going to be rich or rub this on your head and whatever. I did that. They say, okay, God said, everyone had a different story. And the more I give, the more I became uh, more financially distressed. To the point, and I'm not ashamed to say this, to the point that it got so bad that when they asked that there was such an obligation, I didn't have it. So I would write an IOU, $150, and couldn't wait for payday. Mind you, I got all obligations, you know, and taking my money and running to these clowns and giving it to them. Only to be hit with another round of poverty, another round of of the bank calling me or the power getting turned off or something like that. No, I can be real. I can be open up with you there because, oh, I, but I was paying the tithe. They said you are cursed with Kevin. The reason why you're cursed because you, but I paid it. But then I stopped paying it. I stopped paying it, 
and I, I followed the rules of the scriptures, what I'm giving you right now, and on a, a cadre more of them. And as I began to see this thing happen, I say, what? So what I did, I did a, 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 a beta test. So a few of my friends, some are Christian, some are not. And I shared this with them. I said, listen, I know you pay tithe, and I know some of you don't pay tithes. But try this. Just do this for me, okay? If you're paying the tithe, and unless I'll even use a month, stop paying the tithe, stop giving the offering, and not have money, but you would have given even more, ask God to lead you to someone who is distressed, someone who, who, who really has a need, a single mother, a young man who's struggling with his children, whatever, wherever God leads you, and you make a commitment to what you would have given to your church or whatever, now you put it in that person's life. Every one of them, every one of them, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't call your name, every one of them came back not only with a good report, but with an excellent report. A lot of them who are self-employed say, Kevin, I'm making more money now than before. When I used to get paid, Kevin, when I didn't do my do, and I do my money, and I used to send this amount of money to this particular church. And I and I, I, I stop it, and I started to sow in other people's life. I still just give them something every now and then, but, but Kevin, when I start to sow in other people's life, as I'm led by God, I watch my whole, Kevin, to me, it's like, I can't believe this happening, because first of all, I ain't even safe. And I made it clear to them, it have nothing to do with you being safe. See, this is what principles are all about. Principles aren't looking to see how fat or skinny you are. Principles aren't looking to see if you're white or black. Principles aren't looking to see if you come from whatever side of the fence. Principle work for those who work the principles. So now, <laughs> I got my friends now all over the place. One particular friend, I love this guy so much, man. He said, Kevin, let me tell you something right now. First of all, okay? When you don't see me, then sort out all or he said, before I even pay my bills, I take out this chunk of money because I go into Solomon's or Cost, right? And I buy and hold sale. I then got my people lying off. Because one day he even took me with them. Where he's bringing all the wholesale groceries. I had to help him tow them in the people place. That's how blessed his brother is. He's able to meet his needs, his children needs, his family needs, and then share it more. Now that sounds like the windows of heaven open up for me to open up to them for me. That's what it's about. But why is it happening? Did Kevin wake up there? No. Did Kevin tell them go down to the graveyard and get graveyard dust and throw it all up in the air? No. No. What did Kevin do? Show them the word of God. Practice the word of God. He said, not Kevin, my word cannot return unto me void. That's what the word said. And that's what I tell everybody, listen, if you got ears to hear, I ain't telling you don't give your pastor nothing. In fact, God might tell you bless him with a million dollars. God might tell you to give first lady 10 grand. Whatever God tell you to do, do it. I ain't discouraging you from doing none of that. What I'm telling you is this piece what nobody else is telling you. And this is where your wealth is. So God's economy is meeting the needs of his people and even those who are not his people. But he's meeting the needs to by those who are obedient to him. They understand the rules. And that's why the Bible says that, say, that they, they, the, the, his sheep know his voice and another voice they will not listen to. So that's why a person like me could sit in any congregation. They could beg to let tongues follow. I will never give a penny unless God told me to do it. I will, they could never lay no guilt trip on me like they used to do. It will never happen in this life. In fact, before I left the church... Twice I did, I did that because at that point, I was just so fed up. I was so fed up. I was so fed up of, of, of these different numerology garbage, okay? Uh, 2015, uh, sorry, 2009, the ninth month, the ninth day, God said, give 990. Man, what kind of obey this is you working in God house? No, boy, no. I tell you, I, I wised up and wising up, man. I said, God, there got to be something in your How is it that people are paying tithe and they're not seeing what you promised? Because I wasn't talking to them. Go read my word, please. Go read my word. And who was the tithe supposed to be given to? The Levite? Is your pastor a Levite? And if he is, could he show you his birth rights and his lineage where, it, where he descended from the Levites? Could, could he show me that, please? I ain't going there. I'm coming out of the time. Please, we can do that there. But what I'm showing you, if you want to be financially free, if you want to be 
you want to break the, the, the financial burden and yoke that is on you, you will have to invest in those that are less fortunate. Many people, are, and I'm talking church people now, God has provided the opportunity right next to you. That pew you sit every week, okay? You talk about the woman and her children who wear in different socks. They hear picky. They can't afford nothing. When the truth is, that is your ticket to financial uh, 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 excess. Because God wants you to invest in their lives. God wants you to help them because he will do something with you financially. But you are not taught the rules. So what you do? You now criticize and make sport over your meal ticket over here, but you don't even know it. That's scripture. So I got all my friends now. <laughs> and listen, sometimes I got to ignore their call. They come, Kevin, man, you wouldn't believe what happened, man. You boy, lucky I'm telling you, God real. I know he real. And that's why I shared that with you. And now you go and you pay it forward. Share other people. Show them. You don't have to give to no preacher, no prophet, no all this foolishness. You don't have to do that. Again, am I saying don't do it? No. I'm saying to you, if you want to change your financial stuff, there's no scripture. Show me the scripture that says if you give to a prophet, then you can become a multimillionaire. If you give to a prophet, then ain't no more harm going to come to you. Show it to me because I just showed you a scripture. If you give to the poor, you saw seven promises that God said he would do for you. So all I'm saying to you, we ain't got to debate nothing, you know. Bring your scripture. That's all I'm saying to you because if you're coming out the scripture, you, you ain't talking to Kevin. And, and I ain't hearing you. Okay? Listen to this now. Let's go to Proverbs. Listen now. Let's go to Proverbs. Uh, I think we did this one already. Now let's go to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 8. I like this one. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 8. Listen to what it says. It says, He that, he, sorry, he that by usury, and the word usury here means one who charge uh, exorbitant interest on something. For example, let's say you 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 go to the store to buy a loaf of bread. And let's say loaf of bread normally costs like $2. Let's just say that. But you go to the store and the interest on this bread or the, the, the marker price, they, they got it for $5 now. <laughs> or you borrow money from somebody, right? You borrow $100 from them. You say, I can pay you back next week. They say, well, I can lend you this, but you're going to have to pay me back $300 next week. That's wicked, right? So the Bible called that usury. He that by usury and unjust gain, meaning that he gained his wealth or whatever it is that he have unjustly. He didn't do it the right way. He that by usury and unjust gain increases his substance. This is such a powerful scripture here. Yeah? He's going to increase his, his substance. So what the scripture is saying is God isn't going to stop it. He doing wickedness. God says he's not going to stop him. Now, what the scripture is showing you spiritually is exactly how the wealth of the wicked is going to be transferred to the just. You know that scripture, right? We quote it all the time, right? Child, that's why I say the wealth of the wicked, I check it for them. I check for them because the wealth of the wicked is going to be laid up for the just. Really? Because their protocols with that, their rules. Okay? And we're going to see that right now. So the Bible says, he that by usury... And unjust gain, he that are charging people exorbitant amount of interest on things and crooking people on the stuff to gain his wealth. It says, however, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. Now, this is powerful because, like I said, the Bible is clear. It says that the wealth of the wicked will be transferred to the just. But this scripture is showing you the specific category of the just that it's going to go to. It isn't going to go to anyone that says that they are just or that we label them as just. No. God says, this Kevin guy, this Kevin guy who is always thinking about others first, this Mary guy, person over here who's, whatever comes in their hand, they're trying to find a way how they could bless someone after they would have ever met their needs. How could we? Because they understand the law of reciprocal. They understand that they're not supposed to hoard this stuff, but the more I come in, the more I let go out. Because it's a cycle. It's God's economy. I'm giving it to you because I know you're going to bless somebody else. I'm giving it to you because I know you're going to make sure other people are taken care of. That's why I'm giving it to you. So God says, you see these wicked set over here? These people robbing you in the bank and all these other things. Don't worry about them. He says, because there's going to be a transfer one day. But the transfer isn't for every just person. The transfer is for him or her that will pity the poor. Oh, Lord, I love this. I love this. I love this. Yeah. 
He said, for the one that will pity the poor. So that person who's always looking out for those who are less fortunate, boy, you're being set up. I hope you're listening to me. You're being set up for wealth. You're being set up for increase. Because God knows you have a heart where you're not hoarding stuff to you. You want to bless other people. Let's put some more stuff on this. Let's go to, let's go to Proverbs chapter 11. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 11. I love this one. And we're going to look at verse 24 and verse 25. Boy, somebody jumping up right now. Somebody listening to me because we're talking sense. This is scriptures. Proverbs 11 verse 23. It's going to give us some more rules, more laws. Listen to what it says. There is that scatter it and yet increase it. Now, what does he mean by that? Meaning that there are people that are always giving, always sharing. However, they are always increasing. Now, isn't that interesting? Because it's opposite to the world order. The world says, boy, put your money in the bank now, save your money now for a rainy day, which is true. There's nothing wrong with that. But that should be the result after you'd have taken care of your bills and assisted other people. So I'm going to put this set aside. But don't just hoard and be mean and stingy and don't give nobody nothing. So the God is saying here, now listen to the rules of the kingdom for you to become wealthy on the earth. He says, y'all who love to share and give and bless other people, he said, you're activating a law where you will increase in life. Now watch the law of poverty because that's the law of increase. The law of poverty says this. He says, and there are those who withhold or hoard more than what they need. But they shall surely come to poverty. My Lord, I hope you all listen to these scriptures, you know. Some of you all hearing these things for the first time. Been in church for six million years. First time you're hearing these scriptures. Huh. Boy, I tell you. All you know is, is, is uh, Malachi 3 and whatever it is. When it comes to giving. And then all you know is the song. Give to the Lord. Give it in Jesus' name. Give to the Lord. Boy, look at Lord. Lord, I was so stupid all these years, Lord. Lord, I thank you anyway. I thank you that I was stupid. Now I can see the flip side to it. I praise God. So I will help other people. So the scripture says, there are those that give or scatter and yet they increase. There are those that hold on to more than what they need, but they shall surely come to poverty. It says here, but the, it says, but verse 25 says, but the liberal soul, the word liberal means free. They don't hesitate when it comes to this. But the liberal soul shall be made fat. Some translation says, they shall be made wealthy. And he that water it shall one day be watered itself. He that is always giving, people are going to give to him. My Lord, man, I so love the scriptures. You all reading this? You all reading this? Now, let's look more at the wealth, the wealth transfer now. Let's look more at that. Because I just gave you Proverbs 28 and 8. And it clearly states to you. It says that God is not going to stop that wicked man from, from robbing people and doing all this stuff. His judgment coming. And the judgment that is coming is God is going to take the wealth that he has accumulated over the years. But God isn't going to just give it to any Christian. No, he's going to give it to the one who was always helping to begin with. My God. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. My Lord is hot. Ecclesiastes, let's go to Ecclesiastes, verse 26. We can see some more of this. Ecclesiastes, verse 26, what does it say? It says, for God give it to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, watch what he does now, but to the sinner, he give it great travail or burden. What do you mean? Let him work hard. Let him hoard that money. Let him be stingy, meaning stored up in the bank. Why? It says, but to the sinner, he give it great travail, and he caused him to gather and to heap it up, that he may give it to him that is good before the Lord. How is he good before the Lord? Because the monies or whatever resources God give him, this person is ensuring that other people are benefiting from it. That's scripture. That ain't my opinion. That is scripture. The person who is always looking out for the less fortunate will always benefit in life. I promise you that. I promise you that. So you hoarding up money and, and all this stuff and being mean and stingy, you are doing it to your own demise. Very simple. And I don't care what they would have told you in church. I am reading you the scriptures. Now, either you're going to believe opinions or you're going to believe the word of the living God. 
And that's totally up to you. Now watch this. Watch this now. Watch this, okay? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look at verse 9, chapter 9. And we're going to read from verse 6 to verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Excuse me. And we're going to read from verse 6 to verse 10. Because I'm giving you scriptures because I'm showing you. I'm showing you who God is going to bless. I'm showing you God who God is going to make debt free. I'm showing you who God is going to ensure that they always have more than enough. So, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So, Paul is now giving us something that is well beyond the time. Paul is saying now that you don't have to be limited to the 10%. In fact, if you want more, you could. he's showing you a principle here. Now, you could stick to the standard. Ain't nobody stopping you. You could stick to the standard. I make $100. Or let, me, let me give it to me 10. Like 10. Or make sure I give him this in ones. I ain't give him no straight 10. 1, 2, 3. No, 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 no. Paul is saying now, if you want to access the banks of heaven, he said, now there's a system, there's a protocol, okay? And he's telling you now the measurement and how your giving is going to directly affect your receiving, all right? So Paul said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man, listen to this now, every man according as he purposed it in his heart. Not the Old Testament system to just stick with the 10%. God could say to you right now, Kevin, listen, I just had somebody bless you with $10,000. Now I want you to take that $10,000 and bless Sister Mary over here. Know what you can say? Because you, you locked down to a system? No, that ain't God. That ain't God because the Bible say you must give 10%. Huh? T oh, take that. The scriptures say that. Yeah? God said, listen, if you give bountifully, or if you give in excess, you will receive in excess. Trying to help somebody here. See why I don't listen to that boy on the radio? He always trying to get God, people to go against God. How am I getting them to go against God? I read the scripture to you. <laughs> he says, every man. So God has come. He said, listen what he says. As this man has purpose in his heart. Who you think putting it in your heart? To do it. God. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And God is the one who turned that heart however he chose. The Bible says it was God that hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So you're telling me now he can't purpose in your heart to give someone a thousand dollars. I bet you'll give it to your church. I bet you'll give it to those false prophets when they come around here and beg you for it. I bet you'll do that. And you'll have suffer another round where you lose 10,000 here, lose 50 grand here, lose 500 there. You see it every year it happen. But you still convinced, you still have the poverty mentality, even though you're a Christian, doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result. Paul is saying, hey, hey, hey. I hear about the time. But I'm saying to you now, I'm showing you under the new covenant, if you want more, you got to give more. If you want less, then give less. But he said, let me tell you this though. God is going to be the one. God is going to be the one. Yeah, you purpose in your heart because God is putting it there. So if I were you, I would listen to God because God want to bless you. God is setting you up to bless you. So verse 7, he says, every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God love it a cheer. Forgive us. So he's giving you these guidelines. Now listen, you don't give because you feel you got to give. But I can tell you one thing. God love a cheer. Forgive him, meaning he can reward you. If you are one who is a is a, is a is a is a giver and not just a giver, you 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 are a, a, a big time giver. So listen what it says next. It says in verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So God says that not only will I give more if you give more, not only will I give less if you give less, but let me make this clear to you, I can ensure because you are a giver overall that you always have sufficiency, you will never be in a state of lack. 
Listen to this now. Because remember now, the tithe was, was supposed to be given to the who? The Levites? Remember, don't let's play stupid here. <laughs> the Bible is very clear in the Old Testament. They told uh, the children of Israel, Joshua tell them now, when they go into that promised land, all of the 11 sons are to get a portion of the land of Canaan, except for the Levites, not them. Instead, you are to give your tithes to the Levites. Is the Baptist church come from the lineage of the Levites? If the Catholic church is your pastor, apostle, teacher, bishop, are they from, because in the as a Levite is not a title. A Levite is not a pastor. They, that isn't a title like a pastor or a bishop. The only way you can be a Levite if you come from the lineage of a Levite. Now, is Kevin telling you don't give the tithe? Don't, 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 don't rack up no more sin in your life. Don't lie on Kevin. I ain't telling you nothing. All I'm doing is pointing out the facts right now. Is your pastor a Levite? Is your church of the Levitical tribe? Let me tell you why this is important. Because when we go to... Uh, is it Ezra? Anyway, it speaks about the, the, the Levitical and priestly covenant that God made with the Levitical tribe as it relates to tithing. Are you a Levite? And if you say yes, could you kindly show me the, the birth certificate or the lineage in which you are a descendant of the Levite? Could you please show that to me, please? Again, let's be clear. <laughs> am I telling you not to pay the tithe? I'm not telling you that. But what I am telling you is I followed some rules, which I'm reading to you now. And what the tithe had promised in the Old Testament, which I didn't see when I paid the tithe, I am seeing the overflow based on what I'm reading here right now and what I've read to you already. Again, let me be clear. Am I telling you don't give the tithe? But what I'm saying to you, if, if, the, if the preachers get the revelation of what I'm saying, they will have more money and finances than what they're getting right now. More. Because with the tithe, you're putting a limit on the people. That's what you're doing. You're not getting them. See, this, this new system, you, you have to operate by faith. That's what it is. And what that means is that God might say to you, okay, you made $500 this week. But I don't want you to give 10% of this. I want you to give 250 to the church. Some of the, one of the members came into a big settlement in a lawsuit, $2 million. Okay, they were gonna they were gonna pay, they were gonna pay to tie it on that, which I think is over two hundred thousand dollars. But God is saying to them, you know what I want you to do? I can bless you, but I want you to give this church because they're doing my will, give them half of that. Now, every pastor that listen to me, what would you prefer? Would you prefer the ten percent, which is the two hundred thousand dollars, or you prefer the one million dollars, which is half of the two million dollars? I ain't telling you no play no tithe, you know. I said if you following the new covenant, you're gonna get more than what the tithe was offering you. That's all I say to you. <laughs> That's all I'm saying to you. Okay, I ain't trying to butter nothing up. I show you the scriptures. Now, let me let me speak some more on this because I gave you two scriptures that showed you how the wealth is going to be transferred. Okay, and in both cases, it showed where it'll be transferred for those who pity the poor. That's who God is going to give this wealth to. Those who are givers. So, in verse eight of Second Corinthians nine, it says. Uh, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now listen to verse 9. It says, He that dispersed abroad, he had given to the poor, listen, his righteousness remained forever. Verse 10, very powerful. Now he that ministered seed to the soul. What does the word minister mean? To serve. You are servant. So he that serve seed to the sower, sorry, now he that minister seed to the sower, meaning this is what God is now giving you. But who is this going to? Those who pity the poor, those who assist the poor. It says God is now giving, this is a, this is a revelation. He's giving it to a specific person. Who is God ministering or giving the seed to? Is he giving it to anybody? No. He's giving it to the sower. You all missing it, eh? You all missing it? No, you all missing it. The scripture is saying the sower is the one who is going to give to others. So it says when God makes his distribution, those who he knows that are not going to hoard up all of this money, 
those who we know who's not going to keep it to themselves, he says, Kevin, I'm going to give it to you because I know you're going to bless other people. Kevin, I know I'm going to give this to you because I, when I speak to you and says, go down and hunt this, go down and pin this point or, or pay all this money to this person. You don't need to know them, Kevin. And we've done that before. You don't need to know them, Kevin. Send this money to them and watch the report that's going to come back. He's going to minister seed to the sower. So you are just saying, God, how come I mean everybody really getting blessed? Are you a sower? Everybody, even the cinema are getting more money than I are. And you're paying up all this time, paying up all this offering. Every time these, these pastors come down and these different prophets, I give up all my money. They ain't nothing happening for me. Oh, Jesus. Are you a sower? Are you a giver? Or are you a selective giver where you only give to your pastor? You only give to your church? And you feel that your job is done because you already paid your tithe. You don't pay your offering. And you already was just given grudgingly and stingily off of that. Now the law is working in your life, but it's working against you. Because just how you was giving it is exactly how you're getting it. God told you a long time ago, go and give so-and-so the money. Mind you, you did do it, but you do it like two years later. So what you did, it directly affected the blessing that was supposed to come to you. They're holding up on it. Why? Because you hold it up on somebody else's own. The scripture. This ain't my opinion. This is the scripture. All right? This is not my opinion at all. All right. Now let's look at let's look at uh, Proverbs twenty eight and verse twenty seven. Proverbs twenty eight and verse twenty seven, and listen to what the scripture says. It says, "He that giveth unto the poor, we read this right, shall not lack." You all hear this? He that giveth to the poor, you will never lack, never. That scripture. Ask my friends. I can tell you ask me because you can say I'm being biased. Ask the friends who I shared this with. The congregations of which I taught this and the many testimonies that came back showing them God is real. God is a God of his word. It says, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. But he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. So you are in curse here. In this case, is the spirit of poverty will dominate your life. When you hoard and not share with those whom God has given that all of that resources was not for you. God says, okay, good. Remember with the story with the woman and Elijah. When he told her to go borrow from her neighbors all of these different pans. And as the oil was flowing, and then all of a sudden it stopped because they didn't they didn't get enough, whatever. And how did he tell her how to deal with her finances now? Say, say, pay, pay off everybody that you owe. Deal with that first. Keep the rest for you. So the scripture is showing us here that, hey, look here, this is God's economy. This is how he wants you to operate. Not according to the world system. No, don't check for them. You do what the rules and the laws of God say. God says, listen, if you give to the poor, you will never lack in this life. You will never be, in fact, I will send people to bless you before your need even arrive. So all of this mumbo jumbo, but given to uh, uh, these uh, crusades and and these money-making conferences and so on, where you preach in a word only to get money. That don't I, I will I won't say you, you do what you want to do. But Kevin will never give to that. Kevin will never in this life give. Now, if if I catch my right hand giving that, I'll take my left hand and knock it away. Unless God tells me to do it. Because I have time and memorial proven that that there is not God in most cases, not all. You see, because why circumvent all of these rules I give you? And I have, I'm going to be honest with you, I have right now, time is running out. I have more than 30 scriptures outside of what I've given you already on the poor, giving, and all this other stuff. All principles of the scriptures. Probably finish this up in my home tonight. But what I'm showing you here, and this is what I want you to leave here with. Nobody is bashing your pastor. Nobody is bashing your church. Nobody is bashing tithing and giving offering. I'm showing you what the rules are saying. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for your knowledge. I thank you for the gifts that you've given me again to share with your people. I believe you've given to me. You've sown it to me because you know I will sow it into somebody else's life. And that's what I'm doing. And for free. So Father, I thank you because I know by me following your rules... There is a reward that's coming for me, and I embrace that reward. I cover everyone under the sound of my voice right now, and I pray, Father God, that they would look not at me, the messenger, but look at the message and begin to now move in your rules. Rather than becoming offended or angry or whatever the case may be, 
God help them to put their emotions aside and truly focus on your word and begin to restructure and retweet their lives as it relates to your principles in your word. And to move according, especially those who are in, in financial bondage and, and burden with financial yokes and so on, that there is a way out, no matter how great the debt may be, no matter how uh, uh, much of a disarray they are in financially, if they follow your law, if they follow your rules that cannot return into you void, then they will begin to live like myself and many other people who are enjoying their lives as opposed to living from paycheck to paycheck or wondering that if they don't get the vacation pay or they don't get this pay, they are a paycheck away from poverty. So I pray that you would give them a new way of seeing things as it relates to your word. I pray for the leaders. I pray for the pastors. I pray for the church leadership that they would literally go in the scriptures and begin to teach their congregation rather than always taking from them Teach the congregation how to give outside of the church. Teach the congregation to meet the needs of their neighborhood, meet the needs of their uh, fellow family members. All in the result, sorry, all as a result of following the laws of God with expectation of seeing the promises of God come up alive in their lives. I pray right now that our leaders will go and revisit the scriptures as it relates to these things that was handed down to us for years, and rather than reading it for ourselves and analytically looking at it and still uh, taking the, bat the baton of misinterpretation, but to really read it and really teach the people, hey, we were wrong. The things that we told you, we were wrong. We were told this, and rather than us researching it, we told it to you, okay? So we're telling you how to correct it now. Let's go to the scriptures. Let's follow the rules of God. We're not here to show anybody up. We're not here to throw no shade on nobody. But what we want to do is to get the benefits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it is my prayer right now, Father God, that you would do a shaking in this area of the body of Christ, particularly as it relates to those who have a spirit of poverty on them, where they are conditioned. They don't realize this spiritually, that no matter how much resources or income comes to their life, they will always find themselves in a poor state economically. Why? Because they're conditioned to be consumers and never investors. So, Father, I pray right now that the will of God will run its course unhindered. I pray that the blessings and the favor of God will be upon them. We honor you, we praise you, and we ask these things in the matches in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So, folks, that is it for me with that. I had tons more to cover, but I couldn't do it. But what I will do, though, because definitely, let me show my book here again. Next week, we're going to be teaching on church mafia. But what I will uh, endeavor to do between either tonight or tomorrow is I'm going to do a part two to God's economy because I have a lot more scriptures to cover. So for those of you that listen to me by radio, if you want to get the rest of this, then you can just visit my YouTube or Facebook tomorrow, which I'll do the part two. And I need to get that out of the way because, like I say, this is preparing the way for me to do the teaching on the time. But more importantly, next week, God spares life. There's going to be no interruptions. We will be teaching on this book right here. For those of you that are online, who are watching me via Facebook or uh, YouTube, we're going to be teaching on church mafia. This is important. We're going to be doing like a three, four series on this. Now, for those of you who already have my app for Android, I've been pushing that. A lot of you got it. A lot of you said to me, Kevin, you can't leave the Apple uh, platform out. Well, good news. I have an uh, Apple app. You can just go into the Apple store and download Kevin L.A. Ewing Ministries. And you will get your app and you will have access to all of my material, all of my prayers, my websites, my teachings, my videos, all of that other stuff. I have a chat room in there also. You, you could do all of that in there. So there is no excuse now. You got the YouTube. You got my blog site. You got my website. You got my Facebook social media. You got uh, the Periscope, Twitter. You got the apps for the Android. You got the apps for the iPhone. So as you can see, I ain't playing at all. For those of you who have seen my recent videos, you've seen my high-quality cameras that I may have been doing some major work there. I've been changing my background. So as the Lord bless me, I'm just upgrading what I'm doing here, all to provide you with an unadulterated gospel in a, in a pleasant and a clean environment. So until next week, may the peace of God be with you. And God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.